This is our back, and it's comprised of lats, traps, rhomboids, and even smaller muscles like the infraspinatus, teres major, and teres minor. In today's video, we will create the perfect back workout according to what the latest research has to say, and whether you want to build a bigger, wider back, or maybe thicker back, or both in combination. By the end of this video, you will have a full manual on how you can attack your back into your next workout. Let's look at what the research has to say about the most used exercise on our back day and how they attack each muscle of the back. And we'll start with the exercise that helped me grow my back the most, and that is the pull-ups. This exercise primarily works the lats or latissimus dorsi muscle and it's really beneficial for back width. Almost every vertical pull will primarily be for width and the horizontal pulls will be for thickness. Like in this study conducted by Edelberg where they looked at what multiple exercises target with execution and the pull-ups and the chin-ups show the most amount of activation for the latissimus dorsi muscle. The main difference between them is the supination of the wrist which rotates the scapula inward and I would say that chin-ups because of the higher path of pulling activate the lat a bit more. A limiting factor for some may be the grip, but also you can use hook grips so that you can focus on training your back and not your forearm. Let's look at another study that showed latissimus dorsi activation during various back exercises. The purpose of this study was to determine muscle activation levels of the lat, bicep brachii, and the rhomboids and traps while doing different exercises. No exercise type influenced the activity of the biceps brachii. The highest latissimus dorsi activation was present during the wide lat grip pull down and also during the seated rows. Highest level of activation of the muscles of the rhomboids and traps was present during the seated rows. One interesting fact is that actively retracting your scapula did not influence the activity of the middle traps or the rhomboids. Because many people when they train back, they have a lot of issues with their lower back. Like this study suggests that if you perform Australian rows, it's really beneficial for your back without causing too much stress on your lower back. Results came out that the inverted row activated the latissimus dorsi muscle, upper back, and hip extensor muscles more than the standing bent over row and also resulted in less load on the lower spine area which makes the exercise preferable for people with lower back issues compared to the other rowing exercises. This makes this exercise a lot better for people that are dealing with some sort of lower back pain so definitely include it into your regimen. As we can see the row is a very functional compound movement that actually works your whole back. It works your stabilizers the erectors as we hold that isometric position and as we row we also work the latissimus dorsi and also also the rhomboids. However, over time, if we stress it too much with a lot of load and a lot of volume, it can definitely cause some pain in our lower back area. Next, I want to look at an exercise that confuses a lot of people, including me, whether we should use it on our chest days or on our back days, and that is the dumbbell pullover. In this study, they had participants who were all previously trained for at least two years. They were all healthy, age ranging from 26 years plus minus eight, and they all previously performed this pullover exercise. They did three sets of the exercise to warm up sets and one working set with 30% of their weight for 10 reps. They all measured on the right side, exercise performed on the bench with two second eccentric and two second concentric tempo and a goniometer for the angle. As far as the results go, the IMG of the pectoralis major was significantly larger than that of the latissimus dorsi during the pullover exercise. So you probably don't want to use this exercise for your back days, but maybe you can use it sometimes if you're training chest and back in one day or push-pull variation. It can be really beneficial for a day like that. So we have our exercises and now let's create the workout. We will have a vertical pull with the pull-up or if that's too difficult we could use a lat machine. After that we'll perform a horizontal pull of your choice. Bent over rows target the mid back and lats but also a big stressor to the lumbar spine. And in exchange we can use the seated row or bench supported seal row. These are our main exercises that we will start with and after that we can definitely add accessories in the forms of single arm rows, cable face pulls and the different variations with the cables for rowing. This concept is great if you have one pull lay per week let's say but if you want to have two pull days per week you can divide them in one having focus on thickness of your back and one having focus on wideness of your back we'll still train both on that day but for example we'll first put accent primarily on the thickness let's say three exercises for back thickness and then we'll finish with two exercises for wideness and then the next day we'll switch it up as far as rep and set schemes go you want to be somewhere around 10 to 20 sets per muscle group on a weekly basis and it's better if you spread that across two workouts because it will be better for recovery of the muscle and also for performance. This range is typically great for boost 
boosting hypertrophy. And as far as the rep schemes go, you typically want to stay in the range of six to 12 reps. That is like the ultimate rep scheme when it comes to hypertrophy. But eventually you want to have progressive overload in order to improve, get better and get your muscles bigger. So you do that by increasing the load, increasing the weight, but also decreasing the amount of reps. On most of your sets, you want to be really close to failure. We're not talking being to failure, but somewhere around one to three reps in reserve. And here's the reps in reserve scale that you can use. And also you want to have at least one working set gone to full failure. Like this study says, training to failure resulted in greater increases in muscle hypertrophy compared to non-failure training when the total training volume was not equalized between the groups. However, if you take all of your sets to failure, that can definitely lead to extreme fatigue, which can cause overtraining and maybe even injuries. And also it can lead to illness. One of the worst things that can happen is you will have lack of motivation to go to do your workout because you're thinking, I have to take every set to failure and that's very exhausting, tiring. So make sure you monitor your total volume, sets, reps, and weight. And also in every four or five weeks, try to include a deload so that you can have some rest and make sure you're progressively overloading your muscles in order to have the proper adaptation for them to grow. Here's a two sample workout of how you can design your back training. You can use the same workout and progressively overload with linear periodization, increasing the weight, decreasing the reps, but also you can use some type of tempos, eccentric tempo where you are lowering the weight a little bit slower, also holding that isometric position for a second or two when you hold that contraction. Also, you can switch variants sometimes like different exercises just for the sake of having some fun and some exercises work better for other individuals. So you can try that on yourself and see what brings the most results for you. Hope you find these tips and exercises useful and valuable and make sure you hit that subscribe button for more fitness related content and I'll catch you in the next video. Peace.